So for this lecture, I'm going to now talk about drum processes. And in this particular lecture, there will be no original material. So this is really a textbook. This is a textbook material uh, introduction to jump uh, to jump processes. So this is um, this you know as I said, there's nothing original here. But um, I'm, I'm sort of putting this lecture here because tomorrow I will talk exclusively about jumps. So all all lectures tomorrow will be about jumps. And I realized that you know most, while most people are familiar with um, with Brownian motions and stochastic differential equation driven by Brownian motion, typically jump processes tend to be less familiar. At least to you know that's just the way uh, they, they they're not used as much. So what I'm what I'm going to do here is sort of give you an introduction to jump processes. Again, no no original material here. Uh, this is this is all this is all um, uh, textbook type textbook type materials for this, uh, for this sort of things. So let me start by, by talking about Levy processes, which are one of the prime examples of jump processes. Uh, Brownian motion, for that matter, is a Levy process. Uh, so Brownian motion is one of the prime examples of, uh, of a Levy process. And a Levy process is a CADLAG process. So CADLAG, that's a French acronym for uh, continuous from the right and limit from the left. So it's uh, so that means that you can have discontinuities in the path, but they can't be too crazy. Okay, there's, there's a limit to how crazy the, the discontinuities in the path can be. Uh, they are continuous on the right and have a limit on the left. And then a Levy process has the following three properties: uh, the increments are independent. So the increments of a stochastic process that means the differences. Uh, the differences are independent across time. Uh, in finance, that's often what we call the random walk. Uh, so, you know, where it, like in the binomial case, if you go left, follow, then that doesn't tell you whether the next step is going to go right or left because they are independent. So you're not, the, the, the increments are independent from one another. So in this case, all those increments are independent. They're also stationary. That means that all the increments are drawn from the same distribution. So that means the distribution depends only upon the, the amount of time that separates two observations, not on, not on whichever point in time those observations are taken. So if you think about the increments as being log returns, which is what these are always going to be, so you think of sort of x, x is basically, x is basically going to always be the log price, and the increments become the log returns, the differences in log prices. And then in addition, as I said, the, the jumps are not crazy in the sense that um, the, process, um, the, the, the process has uh, is stochastically continuous, which means the mathematical definition that is written up there, uh, which says that um, at any fixed instant, if you fix the instant, basically the probability that at that instant you will see an increment that is greater than, than any fixed epsilon in magnitude as s goes to zero over a very, very short instant, that probability is zero. Now, of course, it's easy to think in your head that that means that the paths are continuous, but it's not. Okay? The paths are not continuous. However, big jumps do not, you cannot have big jumps happening at predictable instants. So for example, a Poisson process, which would jump by a fixed amount, say one, but at random times, that's going to be a, that's going to be a Levy process. Okay, if you had a Poisson process that would jump at fixed times, then you'd have a problem right there. Okay? So it's important to think that, to realize that this last condition does not make the paths of X continuous, but it excludes jumps at deterministic times. So if I know that tomorrow morning the Dow Jones is going to jump, which has a high probability again, I can't tell you the direction, but there's a high probability that it will jump one way or the other again, um, then that means that the price path is not, is not a Levy process. It's not going to be stochastically continuous. But that does not exclude jumps. It simply excludes jumps at deterministic times. Um, now, none of my lectures are going to be about mathematical finance, so I'm not going to get into the implications of this for completeness or incompleteness of markets. But if you know something about mathematical finance and option pricing, you should realize that there is a close connection between jumps at deterministic times and the incompleteness of markets. Uh, 
uh, versus jumps at random times, unpredictable times, and whether markets remain complete or become incomplete uh, in that case. That's all I will say about this because that would really get me off on a, on a, on a tangent that wouldn't be connected to the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but certainly, that doesn't imply that the paths are continuous. Of course, if the paths are continuous, then they will be stochastically continuous, but that doesn't imply that. Also, um, it does not mean that a path on a finite interval 0 to t only has a finite number of jumps. Even though at each finite instant, you cannot be sure that there will be a jump of magnitude greater than epsilon, you can still have a jump at almost every instant and indeed have an infinite number of jumps on the path. Uh, all that this says is that at any given time, the probability of seeing a jump at that time is zero if you fix the time. Now, the independence of the increments has an important implication for, the, imp the independence of the increments has an important implication for the distribution of the process. Uh, which you can see from doing a, which you can see immediately from doing the simple following calculation. If you sample a Levy process at time intervals delta, the same things, uh, the same things uh, we've, we've talked about, we've talked about uh, earlier uh, in, uh, in the lectures uh, this afternoon. If you sample every delta, a Levy process, then you can always write the sum, the, the, the value of the process at the end of n such increments as simply what you would get from the sum of the increments. Which is why, by the way, in the earlier lecture, I told you I'm not going to worry about estimating the drift over a finite time horizon. The reason being that the maximum likelihood estimator of the drift is simply the average of the increments, right? How do you estimate the expected returns? You take the log returns and you average them over the period. But what is, uh, what is going to be, uh, what is going to be the, um, and the light be. <laughs> uh, so what is going to be, uh, what is going to be the estimate of uh, the average return uh, over uh, time from zero to t? It's the average log return you earn over all those different increments. But the, pro the point is, once you start sampling very frequently, no matter how often you sample, the average log return is simply the log price at the end minus the log price at the beginning because all the intermediary log prices cancel. What that means is that the estimator is independent of the sample frequency you use, and at the end of the day, if the time horizon, if capital T doesn't go to infinity, there is no hope of estimating, of estimating the average rate of return on that asset. And here, it's the same thing. You end up having the, the log price at the end is simply the sum of all the log increments. Now, there are lots of different ways of cutting this. It's like you imagine that you have a loaf of bread, okay? Very nice bread in Germany, by the way. And you can cut it in very thin slices, or you can cut it in very big slices. No matter what, it's still the same bread. At the end of the, t of the end, you put all the slices together, it's the same one. But there are lots of different ways of cutting that loaf of bread, which is, might be this length, into a single, into a single piece of bread. As you do that, all those different ways of cutting them, because all those returns are IID, there's an infinite way of writing the value of x at the end, which is uh, xt here, where t is n delta, as the sum of IID random variables whose distribution are all the same because you have IID increments. They are both independent and identically distributed. So in other words, the distribution of x at t should be the same as the distribution of the sum of n random variables with a distribution given by x of t over n. And that's going to give rise to what is known as infinite divisibility, um, which is that because those increments are IID, you know that the sum of the distribution of a sum of independent random variables is the convolution of their individual distribution functions. Okay, that's probably a fairly standard um, um, exercise. Uh, 
And as a result, what you have is the definition that a cumulative distribution F is infinitely divisible if there exists n IID random variables y1, yn, such that the sum of those random variables has the same distribution as F. That's the definition of being infinitely divisible. And because a Levy process must satisfy this by construction, its distribution must be infinitely divisible. That means right there that not every distribution can be supported by a Levy process. If you take a distribution function, a law that is not infinitely divisible, well, there, then, then there exists no Levy process that has this distribution as, um, as its uh, distribution. But there are, there are plenty of examples. There are plenty of examples of distribution functions that are infinitely divisible. Uh, one example is the Gaussian distribution, obviously. Uh, and in fact, the Levy process that has a Gaussian distribution will turn out to be Brownian motion. So Brownian motion will be an example. It will turn out to be the only such process that has continuous paths. All the other ones will have jumps. So Brownian motion is a fairly special case in this situation. Uh, gamma processes, stable processes, Poisson processes, all, um, uh, the, all those distributions correspond to not only a distribution, but also a Levy process. Now, in the Gaussian case, of course, it's very trivial to see infinite divisibility because you know that if x is normally distributed with mean v and variance v, then it can be written as the sum of n iid random variables, yi, with mean m over n and variance v over n. So in this case, it's particularly simple to see directly that the Gaussian distribution is indeed um, infinitely divisible. It's a bit more complicated when things when, when, when things um, are, are less explicit. But conversely, if f is an infinitely divisible distribution function, then it's possible to construct a Levy process such that the distribution at time one of x is given by that particular distribution function. So in other words, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between Levy processes and infinitely divisible distribution functions. Also, because of infinite divisibility, the law of a Levy process at any time t is entirely characterized by the law of the process at any single time, for example, by that at time one, or by that at time one half, or time 0.265, if you want. In other words, as soon as you have fixed the law at one time, then you know the law of all, at all the times. Okay, so, there's, so there isn't too much flexibility in that. Uh, in that. Now, one consequence of that, which is essential for Levy processes, is um, that the characteristic function is going to act in a is going to depend on time in a fairly uh, in a fairly special manner. You see, the thing about characteristic function is that you're calculating the expected value of the exponential of i u x t, but if x t is the sum, if x t is the sum of n random variables with the same law, which are independent random variables, then exponential of i u a sum is the product of exponential. Now, what's the expected value of a product of exponential, each depending upon independent random variables? The expected value of x times y, when x and y are independent, is the expected value of x times the expected value of y. So because they are both independent and identical, you end up having effectively n times the same. You end up having n times uh, the same function. And so the characteristic function has the form that is above in that it's necessarily of, of the form some function to the power of t or equivalently exponential of t times psi of u where psi of u is some function of u, which is effectively unconstrained. And we'll, we'll fix psi of u later on by using more subtle representations of Levy processes. Okay? So it's a class of processes where there's a lot of structure. And when you have infinite divisibility, it's quite natural to think in terms of characteristic function because infinite divisibility translates quite naturally into a specific form of the, of the characteristic function of the process. So you see, sort of, Infinite divisibility translates naturally into characteristic functions, 
much more so than it translates into densities. Because densities are convolutions, and convolutions of things are complicated objects. Even the convolution of two, of two times the same density, that's a, conv that's a complicated object. Uh, whereas the characteristic function of a sum of two independent random variables, that's a very simple object because it's the product of the, of the individual characteristic function. So if you ask yourself, why is it that there's so much business about characteristic functions for Levy processes, that's the reason. It's, it's, it's a natural consequence. It's a natural consequence of, um, of the independent of, of, of the infinite divisibility that the characteristic function is the right object to look at and not the density. So things are going to be indeed very explicit for the characteristic function, but there will be very little explicitness for, uh, in terms of the densities of Levy processes. Now, one particularly important example of uh, a Levy process, besides Brownian motion, which I really haven't mentioned because it's, it's so well known, uh, but uh, a, very, a, a very important example is the process known as a compound Poisson process. So a compound Poisson process with jump intensity lambda and jump distribution f is a stochastic process which can be written at time t as the sum of nt, and I'll tell you in a second what nt is, but nt is a random variable in here. It's the sum of, nt is a random variable with values in integers. It's the sum of nt jump terms. So, and those jump terms are all independent. They are those ji's, and they are all independent, and they are drawn from a random variable with distribution f. So, you know, and what is nt? NT is a standard Poisson process with intensity lambda. So in other words, so what's a Poisson process? A Poisson process is a process, it's a stochastic process, where basically you start at time zero, you wait a random amount of time, that random, of, that random amount of time has an exponential distribution, so you wait a random amount of time that's exponentially distributed, Whenever that random variable decides to pick up, you jump by one. And then you wait another amount of time, random again, same distribution. And then when that random variable decides to wake up, you jump by another plus one. So by time t, you have jumped some random number of times, and you have jumped a number of times, which is nt. And nt is a random variable, and the probability that nt is equal to a given integer n is given by the well-known Poisson formula. So it's exponential of minus lambda t divided by uh, n factorial times lambda to the n, which is the standard discrete Poisson distribution, which is why this is known as a Poisson process. OK? So what you do is by time t, you've had nt jumps nt again being drawn itself from a, a standard Poisson distributions on the integers. And then every time you jump, the Poisson process jump by one, but you, xt, the compound Poisson process, every time you jump, you jump by ji. And ji is a random variable that's drawn from, that's drawn from that distribution with distribution f. So you, perhaps you can think of f as being perhaps a, a normal distribution function, for example. Okay. So you, draw, you jump, there's a random amount, and then you wait a random time, and then you jump again. OK? And then you wait a random time, you jump again. So that's known as a compound Poisson process. So xt jumps whenever nt does, and by an amount ji. Now, by construction, xt has a finite amount of jumps on any finite time interval. In other words, if I go from time 0 to time capital T, how many jumps do I have? Well, I have a random amount of jumps n sub cap t, but the probability that n sub cap t is less than infinity, that probability is 1. So I have a finite number of jumps on any finite time interval. And in finance, that's often the way we want to think about big jumps. By that, I mean jumps that are of order 1 in probability. You see, here, whenever j jumps, j jumps by an amount which is not related to the amount of time that you have. It's, it's an amount of time that's not related to delta. It jumps by a quantity which is drawn from 
that thing, from that distribution f, it's not an amount of time that depends upon the sampling frequency. It's not an amount of time that's small. If you think about the increments of this process, this process is flat, then it jumps by an amount that is relatively big relative to the increments of a Brownian motion, for example, which are all of order delta to the one half. Well, here, whenever you jump, you jump by something that's of order one. So you jump by a big amount. So it's a bit like what the stock market did yesterday. You know, you, you'd need, look, if the stock market drops by seven or eight percent in a day, you would need a really big volatility in front of that Brownian motion to explain that by using a Brownian motion, right? I mean, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, you know, let's do a simple one, right? With sort of square root of 252, that's sort of 15, 16, some, some, something like this. So daily volatility going from a year's volatility to a daily volatility would get you a very small number relative to 8%. Right. So an 8% jump is a very big number of standard deviations from what a Brownian motion would give you. Okay, it's something that would be very unlikely. And maybe it might be a one in a 50 year event. Well, the only problem is we have seen 10 in the last month of jumps of that magnitude. So it becomes harder and harder to argue that this is all continuous, that this is all continuous and that there are no jumps. Okay, so, or at least it's, it's not impossible. I mean, in probability, things are rarely impossible, but they can be very unlikely. <laughs> They can quite be, you know, they can be very unlikely. Uh, so this XT has, you know, has a, uh, has a finite number, amount of jumps per, uh, per time interval, and it's, it, it will be, as you will see in a moment, it will be the distinguishing characteristic uh, of that process. Uh, the distinguishing characteristic will be that indeed it has a finite number of jumps on any finite time interval. Now, the Poisson process itself is a particular example of a compound Poisson process where every time you jump, you simply jump by ji equals one. So if instead of drawing ji from a distribution function f with a finite support, you draw that distribution function with something that is a direct mass at one, so every time you jump, you jump by one, well, that becomes your Poisson process itself. Uh, but in finance, things typically do not jump by a fixed deterministic amount. They tend to jump by a random amount, which is why it makes sense not to have just a point mass uh, that gives you the size by which you jump, but instead it does make sense to have something that's, that's random, which is why we tend to think of compound Poisson processes more than Poisson processes themselves. But obviously, a compound Poisson process requires a Poisson, a Poisson process to begin with. Now, it turns out, and that's the first bullet point there, that the compound Poisson process is the only Levy process with sample paths that are piecewise constant. So in other words, the way a Poisson process, a compound Poisson process works is you stay constant for a while, and then the Poisson process jumps, and then you jump by a random amount, then you stay constant for a while, then you jump by a random amount, then you stay constant for a while, you jump by a random amount, et cetera. So it's piecewise constant. And that all by itself is a distinguishing characteristic of the compound Poisson process. What I mean by that is that other Levy jump processes will not have that property. They will not be piecewise constant. Now, from what I've told you about the, the compound Poisson process, you can actually calculate, you can actually fairly easily calculate the distribution um, the, um, uh, the characteristic function of x, which is a compound Poisson process, and the result is given by this. That's a simple exercise. Uh, lambda is the intensity of the Poisson process, and f is, f is the distribution from which you are, um, you are drawing the jumps. And there is an object that I'm going to introduce here, which is going to play a really important role in general Levy processes, and that's the measure new dx defined in this particular example as simply lambda times f dx. So f is a probability measure, lambda is not. You can see here that unless lambda is one, there's no reason for this to be a probability measure. Uh, so it's a measure, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily integrate to one. And I'll call that the Levy jump measure of x. So here in this particular example, as I said, it doesn't have to integrate to one. 
but in this case, it's a finite measure, which means that it integrates to some number which is finite. It turns out that also this is going to be a distinguishing characteristic of some Levy processes, but not all. In other words, intuitively you will see in a moment that new dx is the amount, is the expected amount of jumps of size between x and x plus dx per unit of time. And the integral over the whole real line, or the whole of Rd, if this is a d-dimensional process, of new dx is going to be the total amount of jumps of all sizes expected per unit of time. And this number may be finite or infinite. It, will, it is, as you can see here, that integral is finite, that integral is finite for a compound Poisson process, but in general, it will not be finite. And that will be the distinguishing, that will be the distinguishing characteristic later on in, in, in one of tomorrow's lectures about whether jumps have finite or infinite activity. Will be whether you should expect to see a finite or an infinite amount of jumps, number of jumps per unit of time. So per day or per week or how many jumps should you see. Now, one of the things that we will see um, in, in uh, let, let me just come back here, one of, to, just to preview this, one of the things that we will see about, uh, about that number of jumps is that if you take any cutoff and you, say 1% for, an, for a, a, a log return, well, what we will see is that if you ask yourself only about jumps that are greater than 1% in absolute value, in the terms of Levy processes, to move from Levy processes to things that are more general, which are called semi-Martingales, which are the typical models that people use in, uh, in mathematical finance. Um, you need to sort of move from things that have IID increments to things that are more general. Because IID increments, well, that's perhaps OK for log returns. But you know, as soon as you have a drift, then things are no longer uh, IID and things sort of start to uh, start to uh, to be uh, to be slightly more complicated. So semi martingales are going to be defined in terms of uh, a jump measure, which is a fairly natural generalization of the notion that makes sense in the case of Levy of Levy processes. So let me introduce that the case of Levy processes and then generalize it. Whenever you have a Cadillac process on X you can associate a random measure on both time and the real line, or r to the d, that describes the jump of x. And by describing, I mean describing both the time at which they occur as well as the size of the jumps. So the two elements of that, uh, of that random measure, m of a, where a is, uh, where a is a Borel set, is the number of pairs of times and jump sizes that happen to be in that set. So that set, for example, that set might be times from 0 to 1 and jump sizes between 5 and 10% in absolute value. That might be your set A. OK, this is a proper, this is the product of two intervals, so this is a nice Borel set. And you ask yourself, OK, M of A, where A is that product set, product, interv in, in product interval. M of A is the number of jumps n times, OK, n instance n times where you have times between 0 and 1 and jump sizes between 5 and 10%. So you would count yesterday, for example, in that, um, and because yesterday was 8%. And you would count Friday, because Friday was 7%, well, Friday was plus 7%, yesterday was minus 8%. So, unfortunately, it would, it's, you know, if you, if you, if you gain 7% and you lose 8%, that is not quite good. Uh, even if you gain 7% and lose 7%, that's not quite good, at least in percentage. In log returns, it doesn't make a difference, but in percentages, it's not great. Um, in any event, um, so that's, that's the measure. That measure, contain, captures that. So m of a is that number. So one alternative way to write it is to define the times 
where, the, where by, by using heating times of certain sets, B, and the heating time of B is the first instant at which you get a jump that falls in the interval B. So if B is again, if B is again any jump in size between 5 and 10 percent, then the first time is the first day when you have such a jump. Then the second time, the, the second time might be the second day on which you have such a thing. So if you started, for example, last Thursday, then Friday was the first day, to, this Monday um, was the second, or Monday was the first day, Tuesday was the second day, and, and, and so on. Uh, and then you can simply define mt of b as being simply the number of such times. Since it's nothing else than the number of jumps that are in that set, you can simply define that, and that is perhaps a more intuitive definition. It's the number of times that you have counted by time t, little t, mt of b is the number of times you have actually seen a jump that fell in the interval b. Okay? That's all that is. Now, since X is a Levy process, it turns out that that mapping from T to MT of B, where B is simply a Borel set in R, is itself a Poisson process. The reason it's a Poisson process is because of the stationarity of the increments, then the difference in those M's is the number of jumps that X has between S and T that fall in the set B, and so it has the same distribution, because those are stationary, it has the same distribution as m from t minus s of b. So just m of the, the number of jumps that you see in the interval from t to s. And by the independence of the increments of x, those of mt of b are also independent. Therefore, that mapping or that process, mt of b viewed as a process in time, is a counting process with stationary and independent increments, which is one of the characteristics of a Poisson process. Which is why those M's are called Poisson random measures. Because when they are associated with Levy processes, T to MT of B is a Poisson process. And then the definition of the Levy measure, new in this more general case for a, uh, for a, um, for a generic process becomes simply the expected value of mt of b. Since mt of b is the expected, since mt of b is the, the actual, it's a random variable, which is the actual number of jumps between time 0 and t of size in b, then nu of b, which is the expected value of that, becomes simply the expected number of jumps of that size that fall in b per unit of time. And as I said earlier, as long as zero is not in the set B, then nu of B is going to be finite. So in other words, if you ask yourself, what's the expected number of jumps, what's the expected number of jumps of size, take B to be any interval that does not contain zero. What is the expected number of jumps per unit of time of size that fall in that interval that does not contain zero you're going to get a finite answer. However, nu of b for something where 0 is in b, that might be finite or infinite. I'm not saying that it's automatically infinite. I'm saying it could be finite or infinite if 0 is in b. So in other words, there's always a finite number of big jumps. By big jumps, I mean jumps of a size that is in an interval that does not contain 0. And there can be a finite or infinite or infinite number of jumps of size between minus epsilon and plus epsilon for any epsilon positive. In other words, in an interval that contains zero. Okay, so it's important to sort of keep that, keep that in mind uh, in the context of what I'll discuss tomorrow about, um, uh, about, distinguishing between, about distinguishing between finite activity and infinite activity jumps. And from what I've just said, Processes that have infinite activities are going to have infinite activity because of the small jumps, not because of the big jumps. Because there's always, there will always be finite activity on the big jump side. It's always the small jumps, the ones that are in an interval that contains zero, that are going to be problematic. 
And in fact, as I said, this is the, de the definition of the Levy measure. Nu of b is the expected number per unit of time of jumps of size that belongs to b. And for Levy process x, you can just define nu of b that way, um, where delta xt is xt minus xt minus. So that, what that notation means is since the process is right continuous and has a limit to the left, xt minus is the left limit. So you've got time, right? It's left and right in the time sense. So the process goes and then it jumps and then it keeps on. And then it restarts, it's right continuous. So the value at the time when there is a jump, the value is the value after it jumps, not the value before it jumps. This is also important in mathematical finance. It's important in mathematical finance to have this in the, in when, when you're studying trading strategies because of the anticipative nature of a process if you let the price be at t what it was before it jumped. If you imagine what a, a trading strategy would be in the situation where there were a jump, you would immediately realize that you would have a problem if the price was defined to be, if the price at t when there is a jump at t was the left limit as opposed to the right limit. Again, I don't want to get into it, but you can go through this in your head in terms of imagine what, why there would be a problem and why you would have infinite possibilities of making a lot of money in that case. Uh, if you could trade continuously in time and there is a jump, but then the price after the jump, but the price at time t, meaning you can trade at time t at that price, is the price before the jump, but then there is a jump that you know about at time t. You clearly have an anticipation problem uh, right there. So, um, so that's why things are defined in this way. You take a ball set B, and then you take uh, all the, um, the, the expected number of, of jumps of the process that have a size that falls in the set B, and, um, and that's nu of B, and that's, that's going to be the definition of the Levy measure. So it's, a, it's an important characteristic of it's an important characteristic of what, uh, of what those jump processes are going to be. And tomorrow I will talk about statistics for those processes. A lot of the questions I'm going to be asking tomorrow um, are going to be questions about effectively the behavior of the Levy measure. In a way, there will be, you know, when I'm going to ask whether there are jumps or not, well, that's a question of whether there is a Levy measure at all or whether it's uniformly zero. When I'm going to ask questions about whether they have finite activity or not, that will be effectively a question about whether the Levy jump measure diverges or doesn't diverge near zero, um, or even questions about how fast it diverges. So a question of this type will, be, will end up being couched in terms of that new, the behavior of new of B over an interval B that shrinks near zero. So when you think of B as being sort of minus epsilon to plus epsilon type of thing. Now, a compound Poisson process can be written as the sum of its increments. That's trivial. If you remember, I told you a compound Poisson process has stepwise continuous paths. So you stay at the same level, then you jump by a random amount, right? Then you wait again until the Poisson process itself decides to jump, then you jump by a random amount, then you wait again. If you ask yourself by time t, what is the value of the process? Well, you started at zero. So it's the, the sum of the first jump, the second jump, and the third jump, if you had three jumps by time t. So it simply is the sum of the jumps that you have recorded by that time. Spelled out in terms of the, Levy, of the, of the Poisson random measure that I described m, it's simply the double integral from zero to t and, and all r of x times that particular measure. That's just the same way of rewriting it. Now, it turns out that you might say, well, you could do this for every process, right? You could write down every process as the sum of all the jumps that have happened by time t. The only problem is that that sum may diverge. In the case of a compound Poisson process, there is no problem because there is, with probability one, a finite number of such jumps. So it's always a finite sum. It's a finite sum, no problem. The fi finite sums don't diverge. Okay? Right? So that's easy enough. The problem is, if you have an infinite number of jumps between 0 and t, that sum may converge or diverge. 
And if the sum diverges, you have a problem. Now, what do you do when you have a sum that diverges? Well, perhaps you can figure out a way of compensating that sum such that if you compensate it by something that diverges at the same rate, then perhaps you might be able to get a quantity that makes some sense. And that's what we're going to do in this case. When the sum diverges, we're going to compensate it. Which is why when you have jump processes, you very often have compensators attached with them. In this case, what are you going to compensate for? Well, you're going to compensate it diverging because there are too many jumps. So you're going to compensate it by subtracting the expected number of jumps per unit of time. Now, the actual number of jumps from 0 to t need not be equal to the expected numbers of jump from 0 to t. But if you do things properly, the difference is well behaved. So the difference between the actual number of jumps and the expected number of jumps itself now is well behaved. And as I said, for a compound Poisson process, this is not an issue. But when you're looking at infinite, um, at infinite uh, processes, um, you, at, at processes with infinite activity, uh, you, might have, uh, you might have a problem. Now, every Levy process with piecewise constant paths is a compound Poisson process. Now, if you add a Brownian motion that's independent of the compound Poisson process plus a drift, you get a model that looks like this. Uh, and that's a perfectly fine model. And this is, in fact, a Levy process which is going to have finite activity. And for those processes, you're going to have nu of b being finite everywhere for the process that is written up there. But, of course, you cannot define not every Levy process is of this form because there are plenty of Levy processes that have infinite activity, and, in fact, most of them. Um, and uh, in general, uh, nu of b is not going to be uh, finite. It's always going to be finite as long as 0 is not in b. But in general, if 0 is in b, it might very well be finite. So the Levy measure might diverge near 0, in which case x may have an infinite number of small jumps on that time interval. In this case, basically the sum of all the jumps from 0 to t becomes an infinite series. And intuitively, it should be clear that when you have an infinite series, right, there are infinite series that converge and infinite series that diverge, right? Well, infinite series that converge tend to be infinite series where the size of the terms decreases fast. And infinite series that diverge tend to be infinite series where the size of the term doesn't diverge very fast. Of course, there are subtleties when terms compensate each other, right? When you have pluses and minus, and there are things that, that, that become complicated. But if you just talk about absolute convergence, i.e. convergence in absolute values, then certainly you want a decrease that is fast enough. A decrease that is fast enough here means that the very small jumps need to be really small. There can be lots of them but they can be very small such that when you sum them up, the sum converges. And for them to be very small, that's going to put an upper bound about how fast the Levy measure can diverge near zero. Because the Levy measure near zero, if you take, think of b as being now minus epsilon to plus epsilon, so you're asking how many jumps do I have between minus epsilon and plus epsilon, and think of epsilon as being very small. That number can be infinity. It can be infinity because nu diverges near 0. Think of nu of x as being 1 of x, nu of dx as being 1 over x dx, for example, or 1 over x squared dx. It's a function that diverges near 0 in such a way that the integral from minus epsilon to plus in epsilon of nu of dx can be convergent or divergent. If it's 1 over x squared, well, the integral is 1 over x, so that diverges. OK? When epsilon goes to 0, that's a, function that's, going, that's a function that's going to diverge. But the function cannot diverge too fast. Because if it diverges too fast, let's suppose it diverges like 1 over x to the 5, for example, then you will see that this actually diverges too fast to the point where, in fact, 
there is no way I'm going to have I'm going to be able to get uh, a convergent sum. So there's going to be a limit to how fast um, how fast um, the new can diverge near zero, and you can and, and you can see uh, and you can sort of uh, uh, see that. So what's known as the Levy Ito decomposition is that any Levy process X can be decomposed in the following manner. So there is a measure new which is defined everywhere except at the point zero, but it can be defined arbitrarily close to zero, in such a way that near zero, it has what you might want to call a local second moment, but only near zero, meaning not, this is not a statement about the tails of the distribution, this is a statement about what happens, and I wrote it here arbitrarily as the, the way it's traditional, which is the integral for x less than one, it could be the integral for x less than any fixed epsilon. It doesn't matter. The point is, you, 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 you're, restraining here the, you're restraining here the rate of divergence of x near, epsilon, near zero, not away from zero. So this is not a statement about the tails. Okay, it's a statement about what happens for near zero. So the integral of x squared mu of dx is that integral converges. And also, the, but then uh, also the integral of new dx now away from zero, which I write as greater than one, but you could take to be greater than any fixed epsilon, that integral converges without multiplication by x squared. Now that statement, the second statement, means that there is a finite expected number of jumps per unit of time of size greater than one or size greater than any fixed epsilon, because that's the definition of new. And we agreed about that. There's always a finite expected number of jumps. Now, in Levy processes, this, you often see this written in as the integral of the minimum of x squared and one, nu of dx is less than infinity. But I find it clearer to present this by separating the fact that this actually puts two separate constraints on nu it's, you know, this is kind of like the way to write it in one, in one equation saves some time in writing it, but it really obscures what you are really trying to do. And what you're really trying to do is you are really trying to, on the one hand, say that you have a finite number of big jumps, and on the other hand, saying that you possibly have an infinite number of small jumps, but you can't have too many of them. You can't have, it can be infinite, but it can't be such a big infinity that the integral of x squared nu of dx would diverge near zero. That means, for instance, that if you're restraining yourself to nu of dx having a density of the form one over x to the a, you are restricting yourself to a being less than three. Right? So that the integral of x squared over x to the a dx converges. For that, you would need a less than three, strictly less than three for that matter. Uh, so it's putting a, a restriction, it's putting a, a dual restriction on the tails, but also on what happens near zero. Now, the jump measure of x, m is a Poisson jump measure with intensity mu, which is dt nu of dx. And now you have the following decomposition, which is a neat decomposition and really separates things into terms. You've got four terms. I, I don't have a pointer, so I can't identify them. But the term B is, B is a drift. C is what is usually called sigma, is what I called sigma in the earlier lecture. C is the volatility. It's in front of a Brownian motion. WT is Brownian motion. It's W for Wiener. Uh, y, what is YT1? YT1 is a compound Poisson process with jumps that are all greater than one. Again, the cutoff one is arbitrary. It doesn't matter that it's one. That's y t one. And y t epsilon with a tilde is a compensated Poisson process. And I remember what I mean by compensated. By compensated, I mean that you are subtracting the expected number of jumps from the sum. It's a compensated Poisson process with jumps of size between epsilon and one, and then you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So that covers the rest of the jumps. So effectively, there are four pieces. There's the drift, the volatility, big jumps, and small jumps. 
with the cutoff one again being arbitrary. The cutoff one could be anything you want. Okay, it could be 0 0.0001 if you want. It doesn't matter. It's any fixed number will, will do. And you see that yt1 is a, is, a, is a Poisson process with jumps greater than one. And yt epsilon is also, it's a Poisson process uh, for any fixed epsilon, it's a compound Poisson process, but compensated. Compensated by subtracting from the measure m, which is a random object, compensated by subtracting its expected value, which is new. Okay? And so that decomposition is very useful because not only you have that decomposition, but the four components are also independent. Which means that once you start writing, which means that basically um, once you start writing, once you start writing, um, once you start writing uh, the characteristic function of xt, because xt is the sum of those four independent characteristics, it's the f sum of those four independent components, if you will, the characteristic function is going to have a very special form because of the independence. And that special form, um, that, 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 that special form uh, is going to be uh, quite, quite useful, in, in, as, you, as you will see in a moment. So to reiterate, to obtain convergence of the sum of small jumps, we need to compensate, hence the use of m tilde, which is the compensated version of m. It's m minus the Levy measure. It's m minus nu. Um, y, tilde, y tilde is a martingale. That's useful. OK? Just like w. So y and y tilde, uh, I mean w and y tilde are martingales. y1 is not a martingale, but you could compensate. By the way, I haven't compensated I haven't compensated the first one, but you could. You know, it's a finite sum. If you want to compensate it, there's no problem with that. You can compensate it, and that will make it a martingale as well. So if you want to, if you want to compensate it, then you compensate the compound Poisson process with jumps greater than one. The compensated Poisson process becomes a mart compound Poisson process becomes a martingale, and now you've subtracted something, so of course you have to add it somewhere else, so it gets added to the drift. It gets added to the drift because it's a, it's a non-random, since by compensating, what you do is you subtract the expected value of the number of jumps, then what you, what you do then is you add that expected value to the drift, and so by changing the drift, you are compensating, you are compensating the, even the big jump Poisson process, and you end up with a martingale there as well, if that's what you want to do. Um, which, of course, is often useful, but it's not necessarily. Now, from the statistical point of view, by compensating and obtaining martingales, you have the hope of being able to get central limit theorems later on, which are things that we might, be, might be useful tomorrow once we start doing tests or distributions for parameter estimators or things like that having central limit theorems will be useful. Now, B, C, and U is called the characteristic triplet of X. I want to stress that B is not uniquely defined because it depends on how you actually compensate or not compensate uh, the big jumps component. So if you compensate it, if you compensate it in certain ways or not compensate it, you are going to change the drift. So this notion of characteristic triplet is always, uh, is not unique. It's important to keep that. Uh, and then uh, that, that, that decomposition uh, gets us straight into a special form of the characteristic function for Levy processes, which is known as the levy kinchin formula. So with that, with that form of four terms, you end up with effectively four terms that are independent. Again, expected value of the exponential of a sum is expected value of the product of exponential if they are independent, it becomes the product of the expected values of each one of those exponentials. So psi is going to be the sum of four terms, and those four terms correspond to each one of those four. The four terms correspond to each one of those four components. Right? So the first one, IUB, that's the term that comes trivially from the drift. You probably have, as an exercise, at some point calculated the characteristic function of a Gaussian random variable, and you know that it's minus one half u squared. Uh, 
or minus one half u squared times sigma squared. So that's a classical, you, so you, the minus one half uh, u prime cu, that's the, the characteristic function of the piece that corresponds to the Brownian motion. Then you've got the third term, which is the, what comes from the characteristic function of the compound Poisson process of jumps greater than one. And then the last piece is what comes from the compensated Poisson process with jumps less than epsilon. Now, if you look at what happens near zero, when you are very close to zero, you ask yourself, why did you want the requirement that the integral of x squared mu of dx converges? And that's what's needed for that term to be well defined. And you can see it immediately there, because near zero, for that last integral to converge, you need indeed in that near zero, the integral of x squared mu of dx needs to be finite, right? Because e of i u x minus one minus i u x, that is bounded by some constant times u squared x squared near zero in the neighborhood of zero. So if the integral of x squared mu dx converges, then indeed that means that the compensation worked. But for the compensation to work, it must be that integral of, nu, of x squared nu of dx is finite. And that's, that's the reason for that requirement. That's the reason for that requirement in, um, in, the, Levy, in the Levy measure uh, at the beginning. OK. Now, let me tell you a few things about moments of Levy processes and when they exist and when they don't exist. So, the only requirement there is in a Levy process as far as things that happen in the tails is that the integral of the Levy measure needs to be finite away from zero. So as you go to the tails, the integral needs to be finite. Now, moments are really ill-suited characteristics of Levy processes because in most cases they don't exist. In fact, what you will see is that for the nth moment to be finite, you need, and in fact it's if and only if, you need that the integral of the nth power of the Levy measure be finite away from zero. Now, for many Levy processes will not satisfy that. Of course, some will. If you take a Poisson process and you draw from a compound Poisson process with a distribution function f, and that distribution function has an nth moment which is finite, then that Levy process itself will have an nth moment which is finite. But in general, that's not going to be the case. Uh, because many Levy processes, and that's why we want them, frankly, is because they have tails that are really fat. So that means that you want to think of sort of nu of dx as being something like dx over x to the a, with a being a small number. It's less than three. Uh, so, you know, that sort of gets you into uh, a situation where the, it's the tail, if you have a divergence in the moments, in other words, it's because of the tail behavior of, in the higher order moment, it's because of the tail behavior of the Levy measure. And if you want to have fat tails, in general, that is incompatible with having higher order moments that are finite. I mean, that, in a way, almost the definition of having fat tails is that you have infinite higher order moments. Uh, so these things really are not going to exist. Of course, if the jumps of x are bounded, so that if there is a, a max value for the, the, the maximum uh, size of the process, then things are, of course, going to be uh, to, be, uh, to be finite, but that's not the case in typical examples that, that are used in practice. Now, cumulants, coming back to the cumulants, the same thing we've used uh, in, in the first lecture. Um, cumulants are just like moments are uh, directly related to the Laplace transform. Cumulants are directly related to the characteristic function. So if you have psi, which is the log characteristic function, then cumulants are directly related to, uh, to, those, um, to the, the, the characteristic function. So in fact, 
since we have an explicit expression for the log characteristic function from the levy kinchin formula, we effectively have directly expression for the cumulants. The first one is the expected value, the second one is the variance, the third one is mu free, etc. The fourth one is the kurtosis, the third one is the skewness, and so on. Uh, and you see from the expression of psi, a few, we can directly calculate the cumulants, and not surprisingly, the drift contributes to the mean, C contributes only to the variance, because that's, what, that's the only thing that comes from the Brownian motion, and then the jumps, they matter for the higher order cumulants. So if you think about the intuition, what do the, when you have a model with the drift, the volatility, and jumps, what do the jumps do for you? Well, of course, they contribute to the variance as well, because they contribute right there, but the higher order moments depend exclusively, about, they depend exclusively on the distribution of the jumps uh, and that nu of dx. Um, interestingly also, they increase linearly with the time interval t, uh, which is something that can be tested because you can look at how log returns, for example, the, how, the log, how the cumulants of log returns increase with time. You can write tests of that. And basically all those distributions are leptocurtic since you're going to have higher order uh, higher order moments, in some cases, in many, ca in many of those cases, that greater than zero sign you see at the end is actually infinity. Okay, let me give you a few examples of Levy processes that I will use um, tomorrow, especially when I do Monte Carlo's, because they are examples that are particularly useful to draw from uh, in simulations. And one class of examples are uh, stable processes. And why are they called stable? Uh, they're stable because they are stable under some sort of, some types of manipulations. Uh, let me start with a property first, which is known as self-similarity. Um, a self-similarity, a self-similar process is a process that scales, that w where there is a relationship between scaling in time and scaling in state. So for example, if you take a Brownian motion, for every positive A, you know that the distribution of a Brownian motion at times A times T, so think of A as being four, for example. A Brownian motion at times four times T has the same distribution as two times a Brownian motion at time one or at time T, right? So, um, so a Brownian motion scales like square root of time at this point, and it has the same distribution as that way, uh, as that. Now, a Brownian motion with drift, of course, is not self-similar. But then you might ask yourself, are there other Levy processes that are self-similar? Clearly, they are not going to be self-similar with the same a to the one-half, but perhaps there is a function phi such that the process may scale in time in this way. Scaling, that, that scaling property is really essential for calculations. If you want to do any sort of explicit calculations, they all always end up boiling down to scaling uh, for, those, for those processes. So those processes, if you have, if, if the process scales in this way, if there is a function phi of A such that the distribution of a Levy process at time A t is the same as the distribution of X t times a constant phi of A, just like Brownian motion, then that process is self-similar. And those processes are going to be stable under addition. That means that if x1, xn are n independent copies of x, then there exists a positive number kappa n, which you can relate to the function phi, and a vector k such that the sum is an affine function of x. That is, of course, true for Brownian motion, because you can just add up, up, add up independent Brownian motions, you still get a Brownian motion. And it can be shown that that's a good exercise, that necessarily the function phi of A is of the form A to the one over beta. For example, in the case of Brownian motion, beta was two. And in this case, beta is a number that's going to be between zero, strict, and two, closed. So, close the interval there. And that's going to be known as the stable index of x. If beta is 2, the only process that satisfies this is a Gaussian or a Brownian motion. 
and effectively a real valued Levy process with characteristic triplet v, B, C, nu is going to be beta stable if there is, so if you want a, a pure jump process, of course there is no, no volatility, there is no drift, otherwise you lose the scaling, and with a Levy measure that looks like this. Nu of x is effectively x to the one plus, one over x to the one plus beta. What you have here is that you have the same beta you have to have the same beta on the positive axis and the negative axis, but the scaling constant capital A and capital B can be different, so you can have an asymmetric, you can have an asymmetric scaling function on the positive and the negative tails. Now you see that these, these processes have infinite activity, unless, be, you know, because the, the, the measure diverges near zero. So you have an infinite activity, and since beta is positive, the, the integral of nu dx from minus epsilon to plus epsilon is actually diverging. So these are infinite activity processes. You also see that because beta is a small number, it's less than two, you also see that you're not going to have very many moments. Because if you try to integrate that function now not near zero, but near infinity, you go now by multiplying it by x to the n, you're not going to have many values of n for which this is going to be finite. Basically, if beta is less than 1, you're going to have a mean, but as soon as beta is greater than 1, there isn't even a mean. You don't even have a mean. So, that for, so what that means is that those are kind of strange processes to think in terms of moments. Those are not, you know, those are not good processes to, to think in terms of moments. Um, and when the distribution is symmetric, the characteristic exponent is simply c u to the beta in absolute values. And you see that sort of the variance is finite for all beta less than 2, and that the, um, you know, the, the mean is finite uh, there at, at the cutoff 1. Now, the densities are not known in its closed form. I told you because of the decomposition of the process as the sum of independent random variables, Densities are not, good process, are not good objects for those processes because you end up with complicated convolution calculations to make. So you typically do not get explicit results for densities except in those examples. Uh, but characteristic functions are always very simple. So you see the distinction between the characteristic function up here, which is, um, which is up there, C u to the beta, absolute value, versus complicated densities that are only known in very, very special cases. And the reason is really, again, the distinction between the characteristic function, which is the natural object, versus uh, the density, which is not. Now, if you want to have moments, one, one sort of class of processes that is useful for that is to take, the, is to take those stable processes have them retain their behavior near zero, but then tamper or dampen their tails near infinity. So by introducing those exponential terms in there, in those Levy measures, the only difference between that equation and the one that you had previously is the additional exponential terms. By introducing those exponential, you kind of kill the, ter you kind of kill the tails to the point where now you're going to have finite moments of all orders, right? Because if you try to, these integrals are going to converge near infinity after multiplication by x to the n for any n because of the exponential term. And near zero, you still have the same behavior as before because exponential of minus ax near zero is close to one. Now, unfortunately, once you do that, you lose the self-similarity property. So these processes are not self-similar. Uh, so you know, what you gain is you gain the moments if you insist upon having moments. So if you want to do portfolio choice, for example, or things like that, I mean, it's kind of useful to truncate the jumps or tamper them or stabilize them or something uh, to some degree. But then you lose something that is very useful in calculations, which is the self-similarity or the scaling property. So you can't sort of get, uh, get all of this. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about sort of properties of Levy processes. Um, 
but that serves as an introduction to what I will talk about tomorrow, which are we all going to be econometric questions related to jump processes, um, usually in semi-martingales, uh, which are effectively, you can think of them as just like, just like you, you typically in finance we work with equations which are, uh, with, pr with price processes which are solutions of stochastic differential equations driven by Levy processes, uh, get driven by Brownian motion. Here we might be working with solutions of e stochastic differential equations driven by Levy processes, which would be special examples of semi-Martingales, or even driven by more general processes. But if you are, once you see the construction of a Levy process, semi-Martingales are a very natural generalization of, of this, with the same analogy between a Brownian motion and a solution in FSD driven by a Brownian motion. So tomorrow we'll be looking at various types of equations, various types of econometric questions related to the jumps. Are the jumps present or not? How do we test for jumps at high frequency, at low frequency? What is the degree of activity of jumps? And so on. Okay, so if you have any questions uh, about either what I talked about earlier, so market microstructure noise and volatility estimation, uh, or uh, that brief introduction to jumps, I'm happy to take them now. At the start of your first um, talk, um, you, you, well, told us something about this trade-off between robustness and efficiency when you leave out um, certain data points. And that reminded me of this classical Huber and Hampel approach using the a bounded version of the, the influence function. And they somehow set up this um, bijection between bounding the influence function for moment criteria mm -hmm. and this weighing function which just truncates the data so that observations that are not, not related to a true model but are mm -hmm. far away from that model are just left out. And um, I was just wondering, um, in your um, example, this truncation somehow corresponds to delta being finite, I would say. But um, could you somehow think of a connection of this, well, finiteness of the delta and the restriction on this score function? It's, it's, a, good, it's a good question. Um, it's not something that I've thought about, uh, but certainly, there is one, and you could approach it using the tools of robustness uh, in, in, in that sense. And um, by, having a finite de by having a finite delta, you are effectively, um, you know, you are effectively restricting uh, what could be really bad in your, uh, in your sample, just like you would do in, uh, in robustness. So it's, it's a good connection. It's not one that I've explored, but it's a, it's a good idea. Yeah, you have just uh, talked about Levy processes and uh, self-similarity uh, properties. Uh, how is this uh, uh, connected to memory uh, processes, for example? So long memory processes will not, in general, be semi-martingales. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean that they cannot be, that they cannot uh, um, effectively have, um, have fractal or similarity properties. So similarity is not synonymous with, um, uh, with being a semi-Martingale. And when you have long memory, indeed, you break down, you do break down uh, the semi-Martingale requirement. Uh, so a fractional Brownian motion, for example, would not be, it would exhibit long memory, but it would not exhibit, um, and, and it would be self-similar, but it would not be, um, uh, be a Levy process. And, not, not a semi-martingale, in fact. So this, it's kind of, you know, in Venn diagrams, there is an intersection, but they don't overlap completely. 